meeting to order. Um, focus of the meeting, we're going to approve the budgets, the OSSD and the RTCC, and set budget information meeting dates. Um, is there someone willing to serve as meeting evaluator today? Thank you. All right. Paul um, Will. He's going to need to inform the back of that book, Paul. Which book? Thank you. Big book. Check that one out. You can. Did you know? I got the Oh, yeah. All right. Orange folder out for Laura. Also, sorry. Thanks. Um, public comment is first. Do you have anything to add or? Say or no. question? Okay. All right. So first is the appro to approve the annual report to voters, which is inside our agenda. Is this Lane's or is this mine? Or is this mine? Okay. So we read this over last month. I fixed the typo, the enrollment. Is there anything else that anyone wanted to add or change before we approve it? Hopefully, yeah, you guys have had a chance to read it yeah. since we got this material on Thursday. So if, if there's um, a motion to approve as written, um, that would be great. Motion to approve as written. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. That will be our annual report to voters. That was quick. <laughs> Luckily, we talked about it last time. Mm -hmm. All right, so the informational dates. The budget informational dates have to be within 10 days of our Australian um, ballot vote, which is town meeting, the first Tuesday in March. So that means that our budget information date needs to be before the 5th of March, 10, within 10 days. So I don't know. What's, what's your pleasure? It's, it will, we, we will hold it in Randolph, right? So generally, it's at the school in the, the we usually do it in the theater, yes, yes. the auditorium, yeah. Um, usually, it's like 6.30, I believe. Mm -hmm. What day do we want to do it? And it can't be March 4th, because that's also the annual, that's the annual meeting. It right, the Monday the before is, is the annual meeting, which can't be that same day. Um, do we want to hold it on Wednesday or Monday? Wednesday the 27th? That works for me. It's fine for me. I think I'm out of town. Mm -hmm. um, they're all during school vacation. I was going to say, yeah, that, that was the only caveat that I was going to yeah. say. We can't do it not on school vacation because 10 days, yeah, you know, so it starts that Sunday. So. Okay, I was going to ask if we, it was a calendar days or is it? No, it's the way it was worded. It sounded like calendar. So yeah, yeah. 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 So we're sort of constrained to vacation week. Yeah. You know, if you want to keep it on a Monday, it doesn't matter really to me. I I can't make Tuesday. So that's our pleasure. I like Wednesday. Wednesday works for me. Okay. Let's make it Wednesday at six thirty. Okay. So that's the twenty. That day, the 27th. 27th. 6 30, we said high school, and we want to do it in the auditorium. I mean, I think the media center is easier to have a discussion. It's traditionally been the auditorium. I yep. have no idea why. Are you uh, comfortable starting in the auditorium and then moving to, the, excuse me, starting in the media center and then moving to the auditorium if we get that many people? Sure. That might make more yeah, sense. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah. Laura, yeah. the annual meeting is always in the auditorium. I believe we've had the media center for this kind that of That could be. All yeah. right. I could be mistaken. Yeah, I think so. Okay. So let's just do the media center then at 630 on, on that if Wednesday. We get too many people, we can always just switch over. Okay. Lane, given the attendance in the other uh, budget information meeting so far, Forecast we had uh, probably 30 30-ish, give or take five, yeah. at um, Randolph. Um, and there is one scheduled for each of the other schools coming up um, towards the end of this month. And I think the, the first or second week of February. Yeah, for January 30th in Braintree. And then February 13th. And then February 13th yep. here. 
How will this budget information meeting different from those? Uh, the information's a little bit more refined. There were a couple of um, minor changes, um, some of them kind of major in terms of the, the potential tax increase in each of the separate towns in a good way mm -hmm. um, since that meeting. Um, but other than that, they will be fairly similar. Uh, to each other, you know, a lot, a lot of talking about what the rationale is behind, you know, the reason that we're looking for this, um, what we hope to address, uh, what we hope to fix, and the fact that it's a one-time deal. You know, we're not going to be looking for this year after year. Um, we're just trying to trying to do kind of a correction, if you will, and then kind of go back into the, the steady state that we're in, so that, that, that people get that idea that we're not coming back to the till, you know, time after time after time. And the annual meeting, is that also at 6.30 on that Monday? It's at 6 o'clock. That's what it's traditionally been. It's on the morning. Okay. I mean, I, I think if you wanted to change it to night tonight, we have to change it. I don't know whether there's any Piggy reason to, to make them the same or... I don't know. It's just always been at 6, so I don't know okay. why. Okay. All right, we'll just leave this then. Any other discussion about the budget informational meeting? That's on March 4th. The annual meeting is March 4th. Yeah. The, at 6. And it's not okay to do the, those two meetings the same night? You Just can't. Do, we, we looked into that because it may, seems to make sense, but you're not. Yeah, I was wondering if the 6 o'clock start time was going to do that. Unfortunately, we can't do them at the same time. All right. Um, Board Management and Governance approve OSSD budget and warning. That also is in our packet. Yep. Let me just make sure everybody's got a copy of it. I'm going to apologize for being a little discombobulated on your start today. Um, was trying to get things set up to do a little budget presentation, at least to show you the numbers and kind of the general outline of, of what we're looking for, because we've kind of talked about the specifics at the last, uh, last two meetings. Um, that's too old to connect with this. Um, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the general overview, but you do have the forms that Robin prepared um, that have the same numbers and whatnot on them. And so I do apologize for that. Let me see if I can pull this up here. So I'll kind of go back a little bit to the last meeting that we had. Um, and we talked about a, a, a couple of important things to start the conversation. And the first is that there are really three budgets, right? We've got the Raven budget, we've got the OSSD budget, and we've got the um, Technical Center budget. Um, in each of those, the funding comes from different sources for the most part. Um, the one we are primarily talking about right here and now is the overall district school budget, the OSSD budget. Um, we will also talk about the technical center budget at the end because that still is outstanding and needs, needs to be approved. Um, Raven was already approved at a, at a previous meeting. Um, overall strategy, before I get into the, the, the number totals here, um, in terms of building this budget was spending a lot of time um, weekly meetings with the cabinet, um, getting a feel for where we stand. Our academic performance um, has been middling um, at best. Um, and to try to really get a, a strong handle on ways that we can kind of turn things around and, and, and do a little bit better than we've been doing in the past. Um, the cabinet was great. Uh, we met weekly for about two, two and a half months. Um, the biggest focus when we began discussing this last year um, was the, the students with the trauma-based behaviors. Um, that they are coming into school um, because of those behaviors, they are unavailable to learn. So they're missing learning day after day when they come in. Um, and that's on good days, on bad days. Um, you know, they can sense things going on around them as a danger because of the traumatic stress that they've been under. Um, and they will have a meltdown um, that will stop learning in the classroom for an extended period of time uh, while people try to get things back on track. So it was taking a, a look at uh, those trauma-based behaviors. It was realizing that they've been around for a while. It was also realizing that as those students go through the, go through the grades and go through the years within the schools, that we're not really fixing the problem at all. Um, at best, with the current models that we're using, um, we're getting them through the day. Right? We usually sit them down with a paraprofessional. We're up to 26 paraprofessionals in the district. Um, which is a lot, um, and they get them through the day. They're able to help them regulate their behaviors, but the problem is is that 
when the paras do that work, the students never learn to regulate the behaviors for themselves. And so the problem never gets better. And so we have this kind of mini pipeline that's going on well, whereas the students will get up through the grades, they'll get out of the elementary school into the middle high school, they don't have all the, the supports in terms of paras there, and then they kind of strike out. Um, a lot of them end up in outplacements, which is very expensive. Um, we have two, two students um, this year that are what, two, about 247,000. Um, so it, it can get quite expensive um, to try to try to work with these students. Um, so the goal is is to put programming in place um, at the early levels um, within the elementary school to identify these students and to remediate them. Um, and the sooner that we do it in their work through the grades, the better off we are. Um, because if we can address it before those behaviors and the traumas become so ingrained. Um, we're going to be better off, we'll be able to remediate, whereas if we wait six or eight years uh, before we're able to attack this and work on it with them, um, uh, things just get reinforced and it may be impossible to. I just have yeah. a question. Um, sure. And because a couple of years ago when I was on the board, Brent had gone, he had been reducing the tariffs because of the new multi-tiered so, yeah. system, system of support. System of support. And that had started prior to, so how come we, did we have, did we have a bunch of students that came in that were, couldn't, we couldn't handle with the MTSS? Uh, the, a, couple, a couple of pieces, um, and it's, a, it's, an exception, it's an exceptionally good question. Um, the first piece is that our special education population has been growing by 1.5% per year overall across the district. Now, when I say that, that's 1.5% more of the entire student population every year that goes by. Um, is our students that go on to IEPs uh, from the previous year. So it's, it's, it's a dramatic jump. Um, the students that have these disabilities now tend to be um, the students of trauma. Whereas with the MTSS, that tiered system of supports and a lot of the supports that we have in the, the building right now are really geared toward academic problems. Yeah, so it's, it's a structural so issue for a lot. behavioral issues. Yeah, but it, in, it impacts. Uh, it can be can, emotional, emotional disabilities, it can be as well. Um, and so we've got, a, we've got structures in place that are really geared up for academics, um, but not so much for the behavioral component. So what ended up happening is as those students were coming in and coming in, because there wasn't a great structure to be able to remediate them, to be able to deal with them, the solution was to, to add pairs. The pairs have been going up for the last three years, again, about. Um, and so we're up to 26, which is, you know, blowing... Uh, that's 750,000 or so we were talking about earlier today for those paras. So the hope is, is if we get those, those programs in, the programs will stay. They, they have a cost to them. But over the course of time, we can whittle away at that 750,000 in paras. And nothing wrong with the paras, but again, the work that they do is not long lasting. It gets the, through the day, but it doesn't give the kids any skills. Right, um, right. I understand that. Yeah. All right, so we've done some whittling. When I first... Uh, came in after talking with the cabinet, we did that pie in the sky budget, which was about an 18% increase. Okay. The last time we met, we were down to about a 12.8% increase. We are now at an 11.2. And we've whittled things down um, pretty much as far as we comfortably feel that we can and still address these problems. This is going towards putting in the preschools, um, which will, will help with the trauma-based behaviors. It's putting in the therapeutic program um, at the elementary school at Randolph Elementary to serve the entire district, the entire elementary district. Um, it includes adding 3.5 uh, special educators um, to help with the fact that we've got increasing enrollments and to reduce their caseloads to manageable levels. Um, it also helps some with some behavioral interventionists that we're bringing in, math interventionists that, that, that's required that we don't want to depend on title for. Um, and also um, an individual up here at Brookfield um, whose job is to help out because we don't have a full-time principal here. Um, Brookfield has got 26% of its population are students with disabilities. Not all of them, you know, severe trauma, you know, there are a number that are academic, but they are also growing by leaps and bounds. Um, not having a full-time dedicated principal here 
um, has caused a problem. And the problem is, is that when a student melts down in a classroom, there is no place for that student to go, nobody who can come down, co-regulate with them, get them calmed down, um, and sit back and process with them. So hopefully they're learning some skills so it doesn't happen again. So are you going to, are you, you're, you're looking for someone who has the background for behavior. A behavioral. Not, not a, yeah. an educational leader, which is the job. Yeah, so when we first started the discussion, um, it was talking about, you know, do we need like an, an assistant principal at Randolph so that David Roller can spend all his time here? And when we really kind of looked at the problem, what they really need is somebody to come in and work with those students. So getting a, a behavioral, high-level behavioral interventionist to be able to do that work, I think is gonna, gonna help out tremendously. Um, it also includes adding a, a full-time um, regular education teacher here. Um, because they need it uh, in terms of the, the growing student population. And folks also have to remember that the population, the enrollments across the district are growing. I believe we're up about 50 kids this year. Um, I expect a, another fair jump next year because there are still some of the schools around us um, that have closed their, uh, their high schools and some of those students are still making some final decisions. Um, so I think we're gonna see some Tongue Bridge students um, and some Washington students as well. Um, in the coming year, and we've got the buses going out there already. So let's put, put the numbers on this, and I, I hate starting off with that 11.2% increase because it sounds horrible and huge, um, and it is. It's, it's a good increase, but towards the end, what I'll talk about is what the actual impact will be on, a, on the average taxpayer in each of the towns, and I think that, that'll help delineate things a, a little bit better. Um, so where we're going from in terms of the budget expenditures with students is last year it was 16.6 million. Um, this coming year it's going to be 18.5. And we're gonna talk about federal grants towards the end of this because that's gonna make numbers look bigger than they are. Um, so 16.6 million to 18.5, it's an 11.2% increase. We had talked earlier about spending thresholds, right? We said there's this really high threshold up here that's currently 18,311, that if we cross that threshold in terms of what we're spending per student, what will happen is we will be paying for all um, of the, the, the expenditures. The local taxpayers will be paying for everything above that threshold. So when we did these, this increase, we tried to stay under that threshold so that uh, the rest of the taxpayers in Vermont are helping to subsidize our increase. Um, and they subsidize about 33% of the increase overall when we were kind of looking at the numbers today. So where we're at with this budget is um, our per student expenditures will be a hair over 17,000. It'll be $17,183 per student. That gives us over $1,000 per student um, buffer um, in case, you know, teachers get their raises next year, we gotta be able to buffer that in so we don't hit that high threshold, or if there are any other costs that, that, that come our way. And that $1,000 per student, if you look at the fact we got about 880 students here, right, it's about $900,000, okay? So it's, it's given us a pretty good, good threshold. Um, and again, as long as we are under that $18,311 per student, um, the rest of the taxpayers in their state are kicking in 33%. Last year, that 33% amounted to $4.4 million of our $16.6 .6 million budget. So it is quite significant. Um, a couple of things just to be aware of um, in terms of federal grant monies, and Robin may be able to explain this a little bit better than I, um, is right, we're shooting for 18.5. The problem is, is that there were changes in the last year where we have to state our total expenditures, which we didn't have to do before, including the money we receive in federal grants, right? Money came in, we spent what came in, um, it didn't impact the local taxpayers at all. Um, but now we have to report it um, so that everybody's aware of the total expenditures for students. It's going to make it look like we're asking for a million dollars more than we are. So with the inclusion of those federal monies there, even though they're not affecting local taxpayers at all, um, the budget request is gonna be for 19.4 million. Okay, so about a million of that is that, that federal grant. But what we're looking for in terms of state taxpayers is that 18.5. That make a little bit of sense in terms of the So does that piece? mean we're actually spending more than 17.1 per student? We're actually spending, because we're dividing we, that million so we're above the threshold then if you include the federal funds? 
because you said we had a $900,000 buffer, but yeah. we're actually getting a, a million plus of federal funds. So it doesn't go toward it doesn't go towards hitting that threshold. It's just reporting the federal funds that that we're receiving because that's never been done anywhere yeah, before. If you look at the expenditure report, I got it's about 876,000, but on the revenue side, I also showed the federal revenue coming in for the 876, so it's a wash. Okay. So we were a supervisory union because the towns didn't vote on our supervisory union budget. We weren't required to include that, but now that we're a school district, we need to show all mm. of the funds. Because before, as a supervisory union, I, I didn't know how much money was going to go to Braintree, Brookfield, Randolph. I wasn't required to distribute that. But now, because we're one consolidated district, we just have to show what we anticipate federal funds being spent. So, but that doesn't, that's, that's no, not. No, because uh, we got the expense and I got the revenue, so it's a zero. So it doesn't go into per pupil cost then? No. Just showing, show, showing, showing what we're spending for federal money, but, but the unfortunate aspect is, is that when we go out, you know, and you go to the taxpayers and they're voting, they're going to see 19.4, and it's going to make it look like it's even bigger than what we're really asking for. That makes sense. So that's going to be part of the communication piece on all this that we're working on. Um, bottom lines uh, for for Braintree. Uh, we'll go through Braintree, Brookfield, and Randolph because their common levels of appraisal are a little bit different. You know, if their common levels of appraisal were the, were the same um, for everybody, then you know what their increases would be would be the same. For Braintree, we are talking about a 10.66 cent increase per hundred dollars of assessed home value. Average home value in Vermont is 201,000. So their average tax increase in Braintree to get this done this year would be 215 dollars. Which comes out to seventeen eighty nine a month, seventeen dollars and eighty nine cents a month. Um, the other thing that people have to keep in mind is that there is a sensitivity threshold. If your family income or your household income is less than ninety thousand dollars, you won't be getting hit for that full amount. Um, I think it's they they were talking about changing it. I don't know if they did not the the threshold of ninety thousand dollars, but I think it's if you're under ninety thousand dollars and your house is assessed at more than four hundred thousand dollars. You know, you hit, you, you, you're going to get benefit from that sensitivity um, threshold. You won't be paying as much of an increase. So, questions on Braintree? Brookfield. Brookfield got hit the most this year um, in terms of their, their uh, common level of appraisal. So for Brookfield, we're talking a 13.58 cent increase per $100 of assessed home value. Again, average value being 201000 in Vermont, this would be a $274 increase um, for the year. Do, do, do you know what they, <clears throat> I, I believe Brookfield's up for reassessment or reappraisal this year? Mm -hmm. It's not, though. It's so not going to be done until 2021. Okay, so it's based uh, on the, this current process. Yeah, so your, your, your local, and Robin can correct me if I'm wrong, your local assessment is right set by your assessors, but what changes is how the state is assessing your values right, relative to it. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so you guys were assessed, I th what was it last year, 110 or 100? 110 this current year. Next year it'll be 107, so that 3%. Okay. Yeah, is, is why yours jumped. Because yeah. you guys were the low ones last year. So that, for you guys, that 274 comes out to 2279 a month. And again, the income sensitivity threshold is there. If your household is making $90,000 or less, you won't be paying that full amount. Randolph, the bottom line would be a 10.99 cent increase. So that means on the average home um, in Randolph, uh, the average tax increase would be $221, which is $18.44 a month. And again, same thing, um, income sensitivity threshold is there. What, what, are, what are you using for your average home cost? Uh, $201,400. Vermont average. That's the state. Yeah. Now, it was hard. I actually tried to get in and see what it was in the town. That was hard to figure out. That's what the state sets it at? Because there's sort of the towns and then the state that they're on. So that's where they're okay. So in this budget, what is there for I mean, I, I see mostly special ed and behavioral interventionists. How about regular ed? Um, are are we putting any money towards besides one Brookfield teacher? Or are we just at, going to? At this point in time, there is, um, and this is part of the discussion, I think the, the high school is still deciding. 
Um, they were looking at either a, uh, a director um, to take over kind of the remediation. Um, they've got a bunch of different programs that help students that are, that are struggling. They were looking for a director for that. They were also looking for a full-time um, foreign language teacher. And I don't know which they ended up. They decided on the tier two for now. To keep the tier two. So all of this in, in terms of the, the teachers, with the exception of what's going into the, the, the public preschool, um, right. Piece, right, because that, that serves everybody. All of it is to address this huge increase in, in, in um, the special education um, populations that we've seen. Remember, the part of addressing this issue um, is that the special education budget, leaving it unaddressed, it's been going up 15% per year. We're at, we're at 3.3 million of a 16 point, actually I take that back. Next year we're at 3.3 million for overall spending um, on, the, on the SPED budget out of you know, what'll be an $18 million budget. It's a huge chunk. So if we can find ways to kind of whittle that down while serving the students um, to give them skills not only so that they're successful here but so they're successful in their lives afterwards. Um, it's going to be benefiting everybody, and that's kind of the goal. You know, we're, we're, we're putting this in because the structures don't appear to exist to be able to remediate this problem. We want to remediate it so two, three years down the line when this stuff kicks in, the costs start going down, and then we can shift those resources elsewhere. I think an important part of messaging and promotion, especially as we try to attract kids from neighboring districts, is to emphasize what we do provide for the top achieving students. Yep. What you know, what AP courses are we doing? What, what other assets do we have as a district instead of dwelling always yep. on the remediation, the behavioral issues, the trauma and this and that? It sounds like so much often of our messaging is around those issues. You know, when we talk about the half days and whatever, you know, I think promoting ourselves as also able to you know, challenge those and provide for the top achieving kids is really important. Yeah. And so maybe that needs to also be part of, yep. you know, the promotion and publicity around this budget is, you know, we are doing this while maintaining X number of, yep. you know, AP courses and yeah, whatever we've... else we're able to provide the, the top kids. Yeah, and we've got, got quite a bit between the, the exchange programs, we've got the AP programs, we're connected with the VAS system. But we need um, to promote that. Yeah, so, yeah, ag agreed. <clears throat> And I would imagine, too, late that this is part of kind of a longer-term vision, that this budget year there's a focus on these. Yeah, because if, if we can free up those resources, we can, put them, we can put them to different use down the line. Right, and so that, I think that's, that's part of the, the message goal. as well. Is that yeah. uh, as long as we articulate that, you know, because I think sometimes we just sort of <laughs> go down this downward spiral of what we're doing quickly right now rather than looking at the larger picture, like, what else are we doing well, you yep. know? And there, there is quite a bit. I mean, there, there are there. To step aside from this for a little bit, we had 50 new kids last year in a state whose enrollments are declining. There is a lot of good that people, people see, um, especially in in the high school year. Um, and it's it's unfortunate, and, and I agree with you 100%. We're we're very focused on this because that's the where the problem is, and as problem solvers, that's kind of tends to be where we focus our effort. But you're right on the communication piece about the, the stuff that we're differentiating for the gifted learners. I think um, it's important, important, especially yeah. as we reach out to the neighboring districts. Yeah. I Agreed. OK. Can I ask a specific question around um, the uh, behavioral like, um, intervention? intervention program in Randolph? Uh, will that be providing transportation from kids throughout the district to Randolph? Okay. Yeah. And so that, that's part of the hope. It's centralized in Randolph. It's an expensive program. Uh, because it's got the adjustment counselors in their special education teacher, whatnot. Um, but you can't duplicate it in all places, but we've got students across the district that have those needs. And so it's a matter of, of prioritizing. Um, part of it from the different schools is if, you know, the student's identified as, as a good candidate, it's a discussion with the parents, and it's saying, hey, are you willing? Uh, the one agreement, however, for the most part is, in general, if you go down there, you stay. You, you finish up your career there because that's where, where those supports are, those specific supports that serve your child. Have you thought about the contingency of, of a family for some reason doesn't want their child to be transported? Are there? Yeah. Um, at that, that point in time, um, I'm getting into some semi touchy stuff. Um, it would come down to if it's a student on IIP, which most of these students will be. 
Um, it comes down to what the team feels is best for the student because um, we are one district. So the team could make the very strong recommendation that this is the best placement for the student given their needs. Um, by the same token, the parent can always reject that recommendation and then you get what's called the state put IEP. They stay doing exactly what they had before until some sort of agreement is reached. Sure, and, and the reason I ask is, you know, with all these resources being put into the program, yeah. I just want to make sure the thinking has yep. kind of followed through to make sure that it's a viable option. Yeah, and, and, and part of the discussion in a case like that is, look, you know, if, if the parents are really against it, will the kid be successful? Mm -hmm. That's, that's got to be part of that, that broader discussion. So. so then your whole attempt to save money and to improve behavior have the child up here without the supports, are we then going to get a pair of them? Are we, and then adding more? No, you got, you've got, you've got, again, the, part of the goal piece, if we look at Brookfield in particular, um, is if everything goes through, keep our fingers crossed, you've got that uh, behavioral interventionist up here. And that's the work that they do. It won't be quite as intensive. Um, but that's a person, like I said, the kid has the meltdown, they can um, pull them out. It's not going to disrupt They can do a little bit of desensitization in terms of the trauma with them. Um, they can also, you know, do that processing depending upon the age of the student. Okay, you know, what's a better, what's, what's, what's a better tack? Let's try it. And if it fails, they come back, they, they, they come up with something else, they try it again. Um, but the biggest piece is um, if the students can process, eventually they get it. Um, but the problem is, is you've got to give them that time to kind of calm down, you know, get the fight or flight to, to slow down before they can process. And that's what, you know, a space like this will allow to happen. Um, there's some other things that we're, we're talking about, um, putting in, um, you know, little, little footprint skill sets. Um, they'll put little footprints on the, on the floor around this room that face in different directions and have the kids do something small in each one. And so if the kid's really blowing out and really uptight, um, usually when they go through a little, little walk like that, by the time they're done, they're, they're calm enough, you can, they're regulated, you can, you can work with them um, and try, try to get things to improve, really talk with them and, and get things moving forward. So a lot of, a lot of pieces to this. This is a big, big thing, big deal. So I did, I did hear a little community comment from the, that, so there's a lot going on for the younger kids, but I, I don't know, my kids are bigger, they are older, I don't know if I want to be, I don't know if I want to be spending extra money, and what's the long-term plan, you sort of mentioned, so we, we've got a sort of, I'm, I'm assuming you kind of have a plan, and you said, we're going to spend this money, but then we're going to conserve it back again. How are you going to manage to do that? So we've hired more people. Aren't we already now going to be at this higher level of spending? So, yeah. So we've got, we've got two things that are going on right now. We've got the maintenance structures that are in there right now, which are those 26 paras, right? And there are some right. other parts and pieces that kind of go along with it that are very expensive. They're not, not producing any long-term results. Got to keep that in place to support the kids while we do the new. And then hopefully if this does its job, we can start weeding away the paras and so this comes down. Now, you know, we could cut the budget. Um, I don't think we're going to be able to do that because I have a feeling our enrollments are going to keep going up for a while. Um, or what we can do is that as these, uh, the, these resources become available, we can pump them into other things, other programming. What would you like to do with the high school that, that's, that's nice and neat and fun? Um, I mean, there have been a lot of discussions, um, especially kind of building onto the maker space that they put in there and building some classes around that that really connect some kids. Um, so there, there's quite a things that we could do. Um, we're at a point where if we get this, you know, barring, you know, getting a, a huge population of kids that come in out of the blue, um, that we've got the resources that we need at that point in time. As things change, we should be able to shift it around. Right? We fix things over here, that frees up resources to put over here. And, and are so able to you, do that. Do you have um, the data to sort of show, I mean, have, are we going from like a one cent, two cent, one cent, half cent, to all of a sudden a 10 cent? From what I could tell, it looked, like, and Robin's, looking, Robin can probably speak historically, but it looked like the increases were, you know, about 2%, one to yeah, two. Yeah. 
But so I think taxpayers look at this, are they going to go, oh my gosh, and do we have any idea how municipal rates are coming in? I mean, because if people are like, bam. I mean, you know? I mean, Adolfo is, he, he's been doing quite a bit to try to get things in control. Um, it doesn't look like he's asking for more. I mean, I mean that was the whole discussion about the police station in, in Randolph. Um, you know, we had a discussion earlier today about the fact that they're trying to lease out the, oh, what do you call it? The town, not the town dump. They have a prettier word for it. The, the land transfer station. Transfer the, tra the transfer station of the Landsville. They're actually going to lease it out to a company to come in and put up solar panels right, up there right. and, 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 and generate some revenue that way. And then they're not going to save a lot because they're not a big electricity user, but they'll save a little on the electricity as well. as. So it looks like he's trying to keep things steady state. I can't say for sure. Uh, but we do kind of email back and forth. Right now, he's just trying to trying to manage things, and make things work as best he can with what he's got. Um, so, can I ask what the reaction has been? I unfortunately haven't been able to make it to the, uh, mm -hmm. the informational meeting that you held recently, right? Was and I quote, Tuesday. and I quote, "We wish this was done a long time ago." Um, and that's been uh, the the reaction um, since last year. Matter of fact, we got a little grief that I didn't push a little harder for more last year. Um, again, that's a, you know that was 35 people. Um, I have not received any negative emails or, or, or anything in terms of the budget um, requests at this point in time. Um, there may be a lot of people that are just holding their tongue. I don't know, but you know we there's a responsibility here that's. As, as being a member of a community, you recognize that being a member of a community means you give up a little bit so that everybody gains, and I think that's where we're at. Um, if we do not address this problem, what ends up happening? We get 15% increases to, to special education year after year. They're switching to a block funding system that we may not be sustainable because it's geared towards fixing kids with uh, academic problems as opposed to fixing kids with trauma-based problems. Um, we may be in a real bind if we don't get a handle on this. And the state kind of has been saying this, um, but again, their, their focus was a little off. Is they're like, yeah, the reason we're looking at changing the special education funding is because there's better ways of doing things. We need you to do those. Um, but instead of getting us to do the better ways first and then cut the budget, they did it the other way around. And the other issue with it is, again, their, their design was for mostly for kids with academic issues. Are you getting any pushback? from the state in that we always were sort of coming in very low and no, I mean, all of a sudden we're going to be coming in Nope, first. we're not, as long as we don't cross that threshold. Matter of fact, um, a couple of the, um, just talking with the superintendents, mm -hmm. can probably just pull the numbers from somewhere, but talking with them, the 17,000, you know, a lot of them are in the low 17,000s around us for, for kids. We've been we've been we've been we've been about three four hundred dollars per student hundred dollars per student under the state we've average historically. In mm -hmm. Yeah, like but like last. I mean, we were we were managed quite conservatively in terms of yeah. finances. So. And and what what happens um, when you do that? We had a little discussion on the on Wednesday. Is that you know teacher salaries are going up by a little over three percent per year. Your budgets are increasing by you know two percent per year, so over the course of time, what you've got left over to run your programming and things goes down. Now, yes, there were drops. There were drops in enrollment. Attrition of staff. We consolidated. We saved. I mean, we weren't really. Yeah. But but enrollment is up. All the innovation that's already here, and this building was basically you know we put a lot of money into this building over that. T over time, and I don't, I wouldn't say instruction necessarily was impacted by that because we were saving money in all these other. But you got to got to remember the the instructionally because we did. You may not have been here. We did the ends reports. Um, instruction instructionally, we are very poor um, in terms of their student performance. Um, APS back on, on on the national. Well, that was just that one flip. The rest. We, been, it's, at, we had been average before that. It's it's historic. I did a five or six year average with the data. Uh, um, yeah, I wasn't here for that meeting. Yeah. But at previous meetings, I remember we were. I mean, that was we were we weren't putting a lot of emphasis. No, the the, yep. the staff and and leadership was they weren't putting they were putting emphasis on let's 
focus on the assessments that we use yep. and the kneecaps because if back then it was the kneecaps because that data came in so late. Yeah, it was hard. It to wasn't useful really, and, and you have to really you have to teach to test to get great scores. So, if I remember correctly, the leadership <laughs> was working toward let's be average and and we'll work on. So we they. I mean, the, the data wall, they've been working on that for quite a long time now. Um, and you know, at least we were given the impression that things were going well. But that's where I would say, and I will say this to my fellow board members, we have been listening to how things are being done. And even to this point, no one has said, this is where we are. This is the benchmark for where we want to be. And then we compare and say, are we hitting the mark we that we're looking for? And as we go to spend this additional pretty huge increase, that is something that I think we as a board need to make sure that we're holding the, the leadership's feet to the fire to say, OK, you're putting in this resource. Where do you think you're going to be? And use that data wall data if that's what you want to use. But give us these benchmarks that you're going to be shooting for. And I want to know in 2019, this is where we're at. This is where, where we're targeting. And this is where we are. Because we haven't gotten that kind of information yet. We've gotten it on the very tail end with SAT scores and, you know, a, compilation of things at the very end, but we, and we sort of did the kneecap. I mean, I remember sitting through kneecap things from the time, I mean, I've been on the board for quite a long time, with a little bit of spell off the board, but our, our kneecaps have been sort of in the average range, but, and I don't know if now with SBACs, are we planning to be the top District. No, the, I mean, I don't, when, I don't when I, I think, you know, historically, um, the terminal, the terminal testing days, so we'll use math for an example. So, you know, the kids will take the kneecap or S back or whatever it is at various points along the way, and then they take it in 11th grade. Um, historically, whether it was kneecap or whether it was S back, 11% of our kids were hitting proficiency. Right. That's nowhere near the state when average. when you compared it to the rest of the state, it was we're th we're, we're th much we're, we're th in the average range. Ma math, the average, I think, was running 37%. We were at 11. Uh, I, I, would, I, don't, I don't have the data right in front of me, but I don't remember fellow bad board members. Well, <laughs> there were some present. Yeah. Laura, but if I remember correctly, we were pretty much in the average range or at least that was what we were told as board members. I think EL, ELA we you were you were a little below average you were closer mm -hmm. uh, but math. ELA we were generally average or slightly or above. above yep and math we were around that average range 11th grade was always our poor point but jump, we weren't terrible one, but we weren't we weren't bottom of the barrel no and so but again is that I mean you're the new leadership you can you can sort of say these are the benchmarks that yep. I want to use and this is my rationale for using it. This is why I think it's a good test, and it's going to give us that data that we need to say yes, we're meeting these outcomes that we're yep. shooting for. And, but and we haven't had any of that. And the math the math the math piece the reason it's a focus is because it's the is is I've kind of gone around and talked with folks around and know what's happening in, in education, um, the math is what's holding our kids behind. They won't go over and they won't apply over at, at, at plastics because they don't have algebra two. Um, and when only 11% of your kids in 11th grade, are, they're not gonna, they don't have the skill set. So we got, we got to at least get them up to that point is that algebra two is a threshold. You can't right. apply to state colleges now unless you've right. got that oh, up your exactly. nose. No, um, I'm, all, I'm all for it. I think yeah. So part of the discussion, but, but part of the, we actually looked at the data on Wednesday a little bit, and what you saw was the, you know, the English was, was steady here, it was a hair below, below the state average. The, as the kids go through the grades in math, it does this, it, it drops. It starts off at, at average, you know, at the low elementary, and it drops each year as, as you kind of go through. And um, I think it was Damien brought it up, we were talking about, you know, why is that? 
Well, it's quite possible that the reason that you're seeing that is because of the trauma-based behaviors. I know the teachers are, are, are doing a good job. I've seen them in the classrooms. Um, and one of the reasons I say that is because math is a foundational course. What you do here determines how well you're going to do in the next year. If you're coming in unavailable to learning because of these trauma-based behaviors, you're losing, you're losing days each week where you're not able to learn. You get to the next year in line, and that may be the reason for that, that decline. Um, well, and I work, I mean, given the work that I do, I'm not on the board. Um, some of it is, is just understanding among the students the, the necessity of math. And I, I, I think among parents, among even employers, there, there's not always that understanding that you really need this. Um, because I run into it all the time. In, in general, American kids don't enjoy math, and they're sort of, have, we have this mindset of, I'm good at math, I'm great at math, or I'm terrible at math, and I don't want to have to do any more math. And it's sort of teaching them that you can do math and, and getting over that hump. But um, anyway, I because I run into it in my work. Kids want to go to college, and then I look at their transcript, and they don't have the math that many colleges are looking for. So that's where we this flexible pathways too on the little, as a total sidetrack, but just so you're aware of it, is again, when we look at, so I serve the, the tech centers in Hartford and, and Randolph, um, and I have colleagues that serve the other ones in the state, is as kids sort of move off to the tech centers, they sort of feel like, well, I'm getting this embedded math and that covers me, mm -hmm. and, and it doesn't, especially a lot of these more technical careers now that are requiring that higher level math. So yeah. we need to be careful that we're educating those kids before they make that transition and, um, and supporting their yeah. instruction. And, that, and that's you know, part, of, part of what's going on, or at least the plan is with this, um, is this idea that you know if you're if you're in tenth grade, and you've missed big chunks every year for the previous nine years, I can't help you. I can help a little bit, but I'm never going to get you back up to that 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 level of where where you should be in the time I got left. So the hope is is addressing these problems early. The kids are getting the skills, so even if they don't like math, they can at least feel confident about it. You know, have have some self-efficacy in terms of believing that believing in themselves as a learner in mathematics. If you're coming in every day and you're stressed out and you're traumatized and you're sitting in a classroom that you can't perform in because you don't have the foundational skills, which isn't really your fault, that's traumatizing in itself, and that that'll really turn off kids. And so, um, part of the goal. But a lot of it with this budget is um, it's this idea that you know it really was a lot of concerted work with the cabinet pulling from them what their needs were on the ground, um, going around doing visitations and confirming, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah I, I see it, I can buy, buy what you're selling, um, and, and really just trying to make sure that I'm giving them what they, what they need, what they see in their, in their schools to, 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 to make things happen. Um, so that's, that's really the goal here. We had the, the principals from the elementary school give a presentation on this data at one point. You weren't there, and I wonder if we could have that sent to us again so we can review it if we wanted to mm -hmm. have that as a resource in case anyone was asking us. Yeah, I can, I can send it to you as well. I can send theirs to you. I'm also going to get you this. I apologize, like I said, without the, the screen there. I'll get this to you as well. But I can give you all the data. Mm -hmm. Let's move on to the tech center. We have a lot to cover tonight, so um, we also have to uh, approve the tech center budget. Do, do we need to actually vote on this budget? Yeah. Okay. So we should, while we're still on the OSSD budget, we need to vote to approve it as, as Lane has presented it. Um, we've had discussion. Is anyone ready to make a motion to approve the budget? Make the motion to approve the budget. I second. Any further discussion? Are you ready to vote? Okay. All those in favor of the budget is written. Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right. Budget is approved. Okay. Thank you very much. I don't know what will happen. We will be doing quite a bit of communication. We've already started. Um, and if it doesn't go through, we will do the best we can with what we've got. That will never change. Um, but I, I think it's um, 
I think it's important to try. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Just a note, I noticed you were doing some front porch form. Um, I think that's an important outreach. That was the, she connected me with that. <laughs> Thank you for doing that. Please continue. All right, so we've got the RTCC, the new uh, iteration of the RTCC budget in front of us. Lane, you want to present that to us as well? So when we um, came together last time for the first vote, um, the tuition came in at 18273 which was high. Um, that was a jump up um, of uh, the previous year uh, from 16489 um, we had talked a little bit at the time that a lot of how much we could whittle that down to um, was really dependent upon enrollments that we didn't have a lot of control over. Um, the amount of funding that the technical center gets and the amount of support that they get depends upon the last three years of enrollments. And for the majority of that point in time, their enrollments were low. They were down probably 116-ish. Um, 109 in there, and we are actually at the lowest point in that averaging this year. Unfortunately, we have 147, 150 kids in the tech center. I shouldn't say unfortunate, it's actually a great thing. Um, but it's gonna take a little bit of time for that increased enrollment to catch up in terms of the averaging for the budget. Um, we cut, or I should say Jason did, did a lot of work um, cutting a lot of pieces. He's got it down to probably pretty low as he can whittle it. Um, and, and he actually, it's, it's about what I said, he's at 17,925 per student. Um, and a lot of that at this point in time, he's cut so much that it's really out of our control um, because it really comes down to, to those averages, those, those enrollment averages. That's the controlling factor here right now because everything else has been kind of weeded away. Uh, that's a 2.1% increase from uh, the previous year. And hopefully, as if the enrollment stays up where it is, um, over the course of time, that means the tuition can come back down. But. So remind me how this works in two R. So for each town, this, I have to be getting my signatures in my mom. And maybe I need to just come in and talk to you. But um, so this budget is not associated with with, with the exception that we send most of our kids, that most of the kids that go to the OS, to go to the tech center are our kids, so, so we pay the tuition. So part of this budget in that we budget for, for the tuition. The tuition to the tech center for our students. Yeah. Okay. So that's where we pay into this. Okay. Right. How many kids do we have at the tech center this year? Do you know? can just be a ballpark if it takes you. This year, we're, this current semester was like 140, but of 140 total, about 70 is Randolph. Oh, 70 is Randolph, okay. Yep. So half of them are ours. Yep. And did Jason think that this would impact um, other schools? No, he, when, it, when it was up at the 18,000 level, um, I said you need to do some talking about this because I'd be more comfortable. I said I recognize you've got that that limit because of the the um, the enrollment piece of it, um, but it'd be more comfortable if it were under eighteen thousand. Um, he had spent a, a good amount of time actually talking with his faculty about what they thought was doable. Um, they're kind of at their maximum, you know, in terms of what he likes to see that that building at. They can only have up to twelve per program. Um, and a lot of them are, are pushing that. So he's at, the, he's at kind of the ideal enrollment right now. Um, in terms of whether or not it'll have an impact on other schools, by law, it can't. If a kid wants to go, yeah, they, they have in the past, and boy, they better not get found out that they're trying to dissuade them from doing it, because that'll be a problem. Um, the other piece, um, and this goes back to the communication, is that, yeah, the, it's, it's up there. It's not out of line with, with uh, some of the other tech centers around, but the difference is, is we do things that the other tech centers don't. We're a full day. Most of those other tech centers are a half day. Um, we offer any courses the students need to you know, get their diplomas from their home district to them. Um, other districts don't do that. That's all on their own. So there's a, quite a bit extra that goes in there for, for those services that, that they're getting from us. Um, so. Right, right, which is yep. nice. I think it's great to go over the side of that. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. so. Any other questions about the tech budget? 
Yeah, but like I said, again, as those, as that enrollments, those higher enrollments um, hit that average, this will change for the better. Are we ready to vote to approve it? Can I have a motion to uh, approve the RTCC budget? I'll make the motion to approve the RTCC budget. A second? I'll second it. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? OK. Next, um, discuss negotiation with unions. Yep. And Robin, you're, you're welcome to hang if you want. But. I appreciate it. I got it. I do have to, to give a, a tremendous amount of thanks to both Robin and to the cabinet because um, they there was a tremendous amount of time put in on all this, which, which was good. But it, it was right because it gave us the discussions about what, what, what we're seeing is important. Um, discussions with the union. Thank you, Robin. Thank you. Coming. Um, at the just to, to kind of start things off, we can talk about the, uh, the CBA first and then we can get to the support staff. Um, there was a little bit of a miscommunication stated by a person at Wednesday's open forum who made the statement that confidentiality was breached um, because, uh, you know, we had talked about the potential impact of what the union was asking for with, with the press. And I pointed out to them that no confidentiality was breached because both the union and the school board agreed that everything would be open. So just to, to make sure that folks um, was that a staff member that said that, or was that a just a member citizen. of the citizen citizen? Yeah. Uh, leave it leave it at that. Um, so in terms of, of their CBA, uh, kind of review really quick what they're asking for, um, and tell you when the next meeting is um, as well. And I'll talk a little bit about the comparables that I've been gathering. Um, so first thing that they're asking for is they want to flip the out of pocket payments. Um, right now, what happens is for um, their 10% of their deductibles, the out-of-pocket payments for medical um, and prescriptions, um, they pay the first 10% of that deductible, and then the, we step in and we pay the other 90% of it. They want that flipped so that we're paying the 90% first, and then basically, if there's anything left over, they'll pay the 10%. Um, they want the towns to pay 100% for out-of-pocket costs associated with prescriptions. Um, they want the towns to train the teachers on their health care plans as part of their paid professional development time. They want their yearly dental coverages doubled and their orthodontic benefits tripled. They want a sick bank. They've requested 60 minutes of personal planning time each day. They want to limit faculty meetings to twice a month. They want an 8% increase to the staff salary portion of the budget for next year, providing raises of between 6.38% and 10.95% for the teachers, depending upon where they are on step and scale. Um, they've historically received 3% raises. Um, when I did my comparables, and I have all the data that I can share with the team, um, they are currently at the top end of the pay spectrum, not only for the districts we compete with, but also for the larger districts in the state, and I even compared them to Stowe. Um, they also have the best benefits package out there with only one other district in the state that I could find that even came close. Um, the next meeting, and again, it's open um, to the public, to the press, anybody who wants to be there, is on the 17th um, from 5 to 6.30 in the Randolph Elementary School Media Center. And so a lot of that, so basically the last meeting. Is that staff or is that faculty, that one? Uh, that's the CBA, that's the, uh, the, the teacher's faculty. Teacher. And so uh, everybody presented, you know, what they were, what they were looking for. Um, this meeting is where we start to kind of go through and talk about whether it's reasonable and doable. Um, support staff contract. Any questions on teachers? Uh, support staff contract. Um, very similar to the teachers. They want the towns to pay 100% for out-of-pocket costs associated with prescription. Again, they want the towns to train the teachers on their health care as part of their paid professional development time. And these folks are hourly workers. Um, they want a sick leave bank. Um, they would like to add additional vacation days with the amount um, dependent upon their years of service. Um, they are looking for, let me explain this quick before I say it. Um, when the support staff are hired, there's a grid that determines what their starting pay is. 
And then after that, they just receive whatever the yearly increases are as, as of the contract. They are looking for a 10% increase to the hiring grid and a 10% increase to their current salaries. Um, they would like to have an increase of $25 to their daily salary whenever they have to sub, um, or if, if they're called upon to sub. Um, they want to be paid for the teacher professional development days. So we have those six um, professional development days a year, the full, um, full day ones. Um, traditionally, they're hourly employees. They have not been included in that, so they are looking to get paid for those six days. Um, the next meeting for support staff contracts is 5 p.m. Um, we're changing the time a little bit. I kind of sent the email around because um, they do have some training that they're doing in the afternoon. So 5 p.m. on the 22nd, um, also in Randolph Elementary Media Center. Um, so a lot. Now, comparably, um, at least the starting uh, scale, the starting hiring guide, that 10% increase is probably reasonable um, when I did the comparables. They are, depending upon the category that they are in, um, you know, whether it's a cook or whether it's a custodian, um, some of them are, are very low by comparison on the starting guide. Um, a lot of them, you know, we were taking a look at, at the hourlies. A lot of them are making sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen dollars an hour right now because they get those yearly increases. You know, typically it's been about three uh, percent. So, just thoughts. So questions on support staff, and I'll send a reminder out too with the uh, the CBA ones this week. It's uh, Thursday. So. All right. Let's move on. Um, Mid-year board progress update. Paul, this is you, the board goals. You guys want to look at this? I don't recall when we spoke about this. Maybe August or? Uh, I think later than that. I can't remember October, though when. Or something like that. We came up with this as a rough draft of the board goals. And so, as you can see, uh, most of those were 2018 or 19 is what we've got for the year. So we're, we should be working on these. And so um, I guess we need to decide what we want to actually do when. And so do we want to say each month we're just going to take one of these and start chipping away at it? Um, so for example, in the action steps, you look to the right. Um, the, the, for the first one, they're gather internal and external feedback on ends, set a date for the next review. We still haven't set that date. And so we haven't started to get that internal and external feedback yet. And we haven't identified who the employers um, and other community leaders that we want to include to get their individual feedback. Um, we haven't decided who they're going to be yet. And so we need to try to do that. That was supposed to have been done in the last quarter there. Then uh, the rest of them, it's about uh, communication. And so I think Lane has been doing a fantastic job in communicating with the public. And so um, the action steps have mostly been met, I think, right, right along. Um, So I don't, I don't know that there's anything that needs to actually hap, ha, has to happen that hasn't already been going on. If there's something, then we can add it in there. But from what I can tell, um, we've met most of these um, communication-wise. The one we haven't discussed at all you know, that we said we wanted to do was whether we wanted to have uh, like mailings or something like that. Um, we haven't discussed that any further on whether we we're already doing the data, data presentations, but we were discussing like Purpose, purpose mailings in addition to like when we do this, um, you know, we got draft warnings and then we talk about these at a specific meeting. Um, do we want to have others where we do data dumps, if you will, for the community other than what we do in here? Um, we haven't discussed what we would like to do, if we would like to do those, or, or what that would look like. So that would be the one part that we need to... Uh, probably talk about and then goal three was board development uh, we still have not heard back from Val Gardner 
um, about the new performance um, evaluation. As far as I know, I, I don't know if anybody's heard back from Valerie. Um, she was getting ready to retire. I don't know if that's changed hands, but I can reach out to Nicole Mace to see if they have a new. I, yeah. I reached out to her. Uh, we're hoping to hold a, uh, another evening, a three yeah, hour right. policy governance um, training in uh, late March for the board as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, I emailed her a week ago and have not heard anything back. So I don't know. Um, what, you know, is that usual? I'm trying to think. I do feel like it did take her a little while. To okay. Get back. Like, um, I, w I was going to send her a reminder, yeah. you know, tomorrow or something, but we would like to set up a, an, another evening um, retreat in mid March for, um, you know, just getting ourselves up to speed on some of the um, things, but. All right. Uh, so, with the board so governance, to me, the governance, you know, or the de development, um, we wanted to discuss the frequency of governance training, which I thought we had said we were going to try to do it monthly or bi-monthly. No, we said four times a year. Four we're having one tonight. Right. Um, so, so far, I've done three. So, I think we're doing all right all as right. far as that goes. Um, we, you know, I, I think we do need to be more cognizant really of keeping ourselves up to, you know up to date and realizing how we can and should be using the policies I think that's true um, so we um, what we have as outstanding is really is that first goal is that first one that, that makes sure that the ends are relevant reflecting the values of the community and future oriented um, I think also could fall into this goal as we could add a separate activity that we haven't we don't have in here right now but based on Ann's comments in the past uh, about um, looking at the limitations of the superintendent, there's been several times where it's come up where Ann thought that there was some stuff that maybe could have been in there that weren't in there. And we don't really have a time other than when he goes, uh, like, for instance, we're about to go over two point something. I don't, I don't remember what the number is. One or two, yeah. Yeah, and, and so other than when we come up to the actual evaluation, we don't look at those goals and so perhaps we need to add an activity of simply looking at all the limitations and are they still relevant, are they still what we think um, are in, in keeping with what we want to have and if we need to add more to or subtract from. The, the good example is why are we going to the union meetings? Um, that's a discussion that I think probably needs to happen. Um, we've always done it, that's why we do it. And so is that a limitation that we should, should be in there that, that's all on the superintendent? I don't know, but that's a discussion we should have. So um, I think activity-wise, we should add a, a second one there. Um, I, I don't know, review of the limitations, superintendent or board limitations, something should along that those lines. Should that be, could that be fit into a regular meeting or? I think so, mm -hmm. yeah. Just like maybe because we're doing quarterly, doing the, um, PG trainings training in between that so quarterly take a new mm -hmm. chunk and, and work on that okay mm -hmm. all right I would like to have a little bit of a focus on the monitoring and I would love to have some training on monitoring because I think we have we have sort of these ends and the and the but but I think we're still sort of a little bit off on <coughs> how we're actually monitoring that's exactly what I proposed to Val. That, that's what yeah. I'd like her to focus us on, is how should we be, be monitoring? And you know, as we're no longer doing board observation, you know, what, what should we, should we replace that with something? Um, or, so that, that's what I wanted that, that three hour retreat in March to be on. And we had talked a little bit too about the fact that there are, there are areas that, and I don't have a good solution to it, there are areas that you guys need to be looking at that if somebody wanted to hide them from you, they could. Right. And I can tell you what those areas are when we get in the, in the, in the training, but that's a, that's a concern that I have as well. Yeah. But I'll leave, leave yeah. it at that. I mean, I think in, in the past we've missed things that we shouldn't have, even though we were trying to do due diligence. So. I, I think, Paul, the only other thing, you know, the, the communication piece, I think mm -hmm. since we already have the principals presenting these things, what mm -hmm. we're lacking really is 
the, you know, the publicity about those. I right. mean, this is an open meeting, but, you know, it's so boring usually. We should be advertising, you know, next month, ones. you know, this, it's going to be, you know, the principals sh telling us how our kids are doing. You know, it will do it first, you know, it's the first thing on the agenda. You know, it's accessible, it's interesting, there's questions. You know, that's what we really need to be doing on Front Porch Forum in the Herald saying, you know, this Monday, these things are important for people to know and hear. So I, th I think that would really help. And then that whole, remember Kristen Hasher always used to mm -hmm. say we had to go back to, because we made these ends way Right, that's what that first ago. one is right there. Right, right. And is, is, are those still relevant? Because those right. were a right. decade and ago. So, or yeah. <laughs> But, but again, because we haven't really, I don't think we've really figured out how to monitor them. We don't have benchmarks. We don't have, like, here's where we were, and now this is where we are now. We don't have any of that. The challenge really is that the report cards now revolve around the ends. Mm -hmm. The report cards do. The right. You know, everything right. really revolves around the ends. So we, we... Which is great, but again, when I'm saying benchmarks, I'm saying... This percentage of kids are going to be at a three point whatever in the report cards. And you and, and this is the ration. This is why we think this is a good measurement of how our district is doing. And this, you know, in fourth grade, we're going to have this many there. And this is why we think, the, you know, and then that could be just the report card piece. Then another piece could be. And we're using this assessment, and this is why we're using this assessment. And 50% of fourth graders are going to be at this place in there. We've got to have, in order for this to really work, we've got to have, we can't just have a, a big data dump of, you know, hey, we're monitoring this, and we have this data wall, and which is all fantastic stuff, and it's great, and we're moving in a really great direction, but it's not that that sort of outcome-driven model, which is what this model is supposed to be doing. So, so the ends, uh, when we did the, did the report early the, this year, that was all revamped to do just that. Okay. It's so not, I, I it's, 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 it's 15 pages, it'll take you a while. Um, it was, uh, it's, it's not perfect, um, but it gets right to that. And yeah, and what I've done is I've worked with the, um, the cabinet um, and they are talking with the departments with each one of those effects. And I'm giving them the opportunity to reinterpret it a little bit. You know, I, I, I talked with them, I talked with the cabinet a little bit and pulled in all the ideas when I created that report. But they've got things that they've seen since they've been looking at some of the data that they'd like to massage a little bit. So you're gonna see some changes on that. But that's exactly what that did is, you know, by 2021, you know, 40% of the, you know, fourth graders will be, you know, achieving, you know, proficient on the, the math, uh, you know, SBAC. It was that sort of a, and then the discussion about why why that specific tool is chosen for these these students. Okay, right, right. So, but so doesn't I'll mean it's perfect. It yes. was the first shot right. at. I'll take a look at it. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean it's a work in progress. I'm not, you know, we're all sort of learning, and and we're going to be massaging it along the way yep. until we sort of get a system in place that. Yeah. that but the value is in that discussion because that's where we learn what's right. important. Oh yeah. Well, and I'm glad to hear teachers are being involved in it because you know they're on the ground doing it and yep. they're seeing you know what's what's happening and that to me makes it seem like it's not just administrators who are rushing to yep. put a bunch of numbers together to then data dump to the board. I want it to be meaningful and yeah. and and helpful to move the system forward and hopefully achieve. Yep. And that that was part of the discussion with it is um, in, in the reason that some of those assessment tools were chosen was just for that. They all had to have value to the teachers to be able to inform their instruction. Right? If they're collecting data that doesn't help them go back into the classroom after something's been taught um, and, and help them to say, yeah, we, we did really well here with these kids on the, these, these, these standards or, or not, then it's not going to be useful to anybody. It's not going to drive things in the right direction. That's sort of the trend in education now. Right? Ten, I mean, ten years, yeah. The trend in everything yeah. now is this. That's the standard, standard base. Data-driven 
evidence based improvement yep. quality you know it seems to be yeah it came from it came from a business model sort of <laughs> came from a business model but right. sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't right right right, right. sometimes there's no data yep <laughs> So Sometimes let's go back to the board um, goals. So we're, you're proposing to add sort of focus and on the ends a few times, you know, every th three months or something like that. Yeah, mm -hmm. so I would say, uh, so part of this gather internal and external feedback lines, we haven't de determined when we're going to do the next review yet. I think that that's fine. But one of the ones, we, the, the next part of that benchmark is board meet the leaders in education and employment <coughs> sectors to develop a future focused vision. I think that that's one that we should be adding in doing the quarterly type thing where each quarter bring in some new people to just, we always have the principals come in, but what about other people? What, what about the business leaders? What about educational leaders other than our internal leaders? So we have uh, the, uh, not any, uh, our superintendents association guy comes. Um, Jeff. Uh, and he talks. And VSBA. Right, and VSBA. And then we also have Mark McDonald and our other legislators come. And, and those are good, but what about other people? We, we need other. So the, I would say that's one day that we have, well, I guess it was two, two separate days. So I would say maybe come up with two more groups. I, mm -hmm. I don't know who, but we, we as a board should determine who we'd like to see come in and then have them do something similar where it's kind of a question and answer. They, they say, so from my sector's point of view, these things are going on. So there's just a be open. Matt at the, um, right. if you're an employer. Uh, at the Department of Labor, who I ran into, and he will, he will come to a board and sort of give us a snapshot of sort of where, it, he'll, he'll look at the labor market in Vermont I can see if he could do sort of New England or, you know, sort of what's out there, what are employers looking for. Um, I always get into little arguments with them because, they, you know, there's a lot of work, but it's a lot of the work is, there are a lot of jobs, but they're not livable wage jobs. So I'm always like, I want to know about the livable wage jobs, not just there's jobs out there because, um, you know, that's the goal is to, you know, hopefully get our students to the point where they can find work that's a livable wage work mm -hmm. um, so they can be independent people. But anyway, that So do you want to set up a meeting that with him? Be some, yeah, he would come and, and sort of give us a view on sort of where Vermont's headed in the next 10, 15 years. I think we have data up to 10 or 15 years. And he's, he's, he's a fun guy to... So maybe May or June? Yeah, Which April. Is, March is going to be packed. Right, and, <laughs> and well, June's packed. Yeah. So, so or yeah, or April. So maybe see if he's, if he's available. For a regular board, board night. The other, other possibilities, you know, if you want to go on the education side, you got Pat Bolton right up at UTC. Mm -hmm. Might not be a bad person to reach out because um, she'll have a lot of demographics on, on the college-bound folks, especially in the tech industries. And then, um, depending upon which group they're with, that R three group that's in town that's doing the mm -hmm. you know the the reinvest. Right, re yeah, the re um, there's there's quite a few um, pretty good experts and some of them own businesses in and around, so that might not be bad. Just, just ideas. Yeah. yeah, you guys are talking about it. Yeah. Right. So that kind of thing. Um, Ken Cado at the high school yep. is doing a bunch with um, you know just look. I mean, area employers they they are looking for. Employees right. <laughs> and they're they're struggling to find. Get their algebra two skills. Um, so <laughs> uh, he, you know, I don't know if he might have some people. So somebody from business is somebody. So the, the labor uh, department of labor guy sounds good, and then somebody from education would be another. So mm -hmm. maybe the BTC guy, and then we rotate through. Remember in yeah. previous years too, we sort of read. You know, we found. A book and I, I came across one but now I can't remember what but those are always kind of fun too where it's somebody who's just sort of coaching about you know what is the future going to look like because mm -hmm. really when we have a little kindergartner starting there's a long way mm -hmm. from now um, to sort of have a sense of sort of where we're going in the world um, might be kind of that maybe we do that, we assign the book in like June, so right. we have all summer for you. Yeah. Um, but that, I, I can, I, I'll try and find that title that 
I don't know if he's a really good futuristic one. I don't know if anybody But again, it's that future. All I can hear is Kristen Husher saying, future, future. Mm -hmm. That's really what this first goal is about, is, is it's supposed to be the, the future. Right. So at, at that, and then I think on, under the uh, action step for goal two, um, just adding in advertising for the part where it says uh, Superintendent will present data for community at monthly board meetings. We just... Who's going to take charge of that? The advertising? Mm hmm The publicity. Mm -hmm. I think, no, no, I'm you? not stepping up, nope. <laughs> but what I was gonna say is, I do think, I know, Lane, I think you've been hooked up now with Front Porch mm -hmm. Forum, but I've always thought that there should be a board member that has, you know, sort of a dedicated responsibility towards putting stuff on Front Porch Forum. So just throwing that out there as an idea. You know, that in the Herald, is someone willing to, to do those two things? I mean, someone could advertise, promote our February meeting because Nicole and, or, someone from Nicole's office and Jeff and the legislators are going to be there. It's the first thing in the meeting. It's interesting. It, I think it would, you know, a, be of wider interest. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Just one of you willing to take that on? I can do that. <coughs> Thank you. At least, yeah, for the, r rant, like the, the front porch forum, yeah. it's for the, all the areas. For right. Yeah. Okay. For that right. and, and, and the Herald, that would be great. Um, and this is to try to get people to come to meetings? Yeah. Yeah, or just to average, you know, that this is, might be of interest okay. for people who are interested for that. Most for people, that yeah, that's true. That piece, right, they can leave. Most people don't come out because it's like dinner time and they're trying to get their kids all I know. bed. So I, I don't know how much that will help, but we could get some people. Have we thought about putting out information about what happened at meetings, or like posting information about what was discussed already? We do have Orca. We do, but how I mean. The Herald kind of does but that. But maybe. Yeah. She summarized the meeting a little they bit. They do. Usually, uh, what? With that Orca thing? Zoe. 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 Skip stuff, right? They have, they have, uh, they have click, clickable agendas, the agenda, so they just, the bullet points are there, and they just click on whatever they want to see and jumps, jumps to, to that. that point. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to get a link to that to put that on Front Porch Forum? Absolutely. So I could post the link to I this was contact with the person at Orca yeah. to coordinate over there because it could be that if you want to here was the right. last meeting and then this is what's coming up at the upcoming meeting perfect I, that's great. or here's the bold. people this is where you go to if you want to see this and it has you don't have to watch the whole thing that should be there yeah but right you're interested in any of the things that happened see. click here and then coming up if you want to attend a meeting and then that would be that could be like a, a monthly front porch farm. That would be great. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think that's sure. a terrific idea. I Thank you. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, let's move on. We're way after our time here. Um, discuss partial tuition forgiveness. Um, so, uh, at the beginning of the year, because of the consolidation of Roxbury with Montpelier. There were a number of um, parents that were very fearful of sending their kids to a large school um, and trying to get them in at Braintree. Um, Brain, Braintree has a very good reputation. Um, most of them ended up going because, you know, I, I, I sat down, I explained with them. I, I also set them up to kind of talk with the folks over at Montpelier um, that, you know, unless the board approves, you know, a uh, transfer of this nature, so it, it can't happen. Um, we had one parent who was very adamant and um, agreed that they would uh, self-fund um, their student going to Braintree. So we accepted that. Um, when it became apparent a few weeks in that they weren't paying the bills, um, gave them a week um, to you know, follow through, pay the bill, or get their child enrolled in Montpelier, um, and then ended up working to get the child over at Montpelier where the, the child currently is. Um, as part of those discussions at that point in time, there were some extended family members that were involved, um, and it's very apparent that the parents do not have the means. Um, it, it, technically, it didn't cost us anything to have the student um, at Braintree. It's not like we had to add staff or anything because that student was there. Um, so rather than continuing to pursue this, which executive limitations requires me to, um, is to ask the board to, to forgive that, that debt on behalf of the parent. There's two parts of it. The, in terms of the tuition piece, uh, what they owe is about 3,000. 
um, but there's also an after school piece. I am not asking that the after school piece be forgiven. Um, the after school program, it's a small dollar amount. They should be able to, to pay and I'll continue to pursue that. Does anyone have any issue with forgiving this um, tuition? Okay. Just so I understand, so the, it's for forgiveness for tuition during that time when the student was at Braintree and that student is now enrolled in Montpelier, is that correct? Yeah, okay. yeah. so a, they weren't paying the bills. We got them connected with Montpelier, got them transferred over. And, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Do we need to vote on this? We will. Probably. Let's vote. Oh, do I have a motion yep, to forgive this tuition um, bill for this family? Motion to forgive. All set. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Okay. Um, the Raven Building update. Uh, okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, say at the end of this conversation, I'm going to say something publicly that has not been said publicly before. So... Um, as they've been going through, they've had the engineers down there, they've done the ground surveys, um, they're taking a look at things. The more that they look at, the more issues that pop up. Um, you know, it's, uh, it, it's not just replacing the building and the foundation at this point in time and rotating the building um, so that it's uh, structurally sound on the soil that's there, but the septic tank was never properly maintained. The septic is gonna have to be replaced. It's old, um, there's the issue of heat. Um, it did not ever really have real heat. Originally, it was wood fired. They were, you know, stoking a wood stove to try to keep the place warm. And then a year or so ago, they put in a propane heater that was done in house and not up to spec. Um, so the heat is an issue. So the, the best scenario that they've got um, to heat that, and probably they were trying to combine a few things, they were trying to combine the repaving um, with supplying heat to the, the new Raven building. Um, was to actually run a, a water line um, out to uh, Raven from the boilers at the high school. Um, and that would allow them to also then go back and then kind of repave that area that needs to be repaved. Um, they also were looking at adding 1,000 square feet to the building um, to increase the um, size of the program uh, because there is always a waiting list. Um, it does save the districts that uh, send the students there as well as our own uh, quite a bit of money. It's about a million dollars every seven years or so for us that it saves us. Um, they're coming in um, around, they're saying 1.3 million. Wow. So I want to talk about this. Not, I'm not proposing that we go for the, the 1.3 million. Um, but I want to talk about a, a, a potential alternative to this that, that may be suitable, but it'll probably upset some folks. Um, the warehouse that was built has the office in the back, um, has a nice place upstairs that could be a classroom. I'm going to make the recommendation um, that we take over that warehouse for uh, the Raven students. It has, uh, you'd be surprised what's, what, what was put in there. Um, uh, and you guys, I can give you a tour if you'd like. Um, it's an ideal situation, um, the revamping of it. You know, they, there should be a kitchen that, that need, would need to be added. There is a loft up top that was intended to be a, a very large conference room, uh, probably a third the size of this area here that could be converted to the classroom space. Um, it's heated. It has a... a full office in there and then a space that could be the kitchen as well and it's got the bathroom it's got the lifts already it's got everything it needs um, and then the suggestion would be it's to got lifts in it? oh yeah oh. The, the, suge the, the suggestion would be to um uh, or lifts available for it that are that are, are uh, present um the suggestion would be to take the stuff that is stored in that warehouse and store it in the raven um, again, the big issue with the Raven, um, it's got the mold, it's got the mildew, it's got a lot. But if we're just storing stuff there that's covered, that might be the better. What so, is stored in, in well, that it was, warehouse Well, it was originally, supposedly it was built to be a central supply. Right. So that all the, um, the materials would go there, and then when people wanted it, they would go into a software system and say, hey, I need 40 rolls of toilet paper today, and right. just to help with tracking and ordering. Um, has not been used as that. Things seem to be going you know, very well with that. It, the, a lot of those materials could probably be actually stored right in their specific buildings as well. Um, so that's the other possibility. Um, so wow. Was, that's, that was an idea that I had thought earlier, but when the... The initial 
evaluation, the magnitude estimate came in. You know, they were saying about 600,000. Uh, that there, there was not any maintenance really done on that for a significant amount of time. Um, it's just, it's, it's a mess. I mean, it really is. So what would this warehouse cost to make it a, you know, a, a class, classrooms and a, and a space for kids? Everything uh, that you'd need for I, kids. I haven't, I haven't done an actual estimate, but you know, put a kitchen in, you know, maybe, maybe 15, 20 grand to put the classroom in, maybe 10, 15 grand. And it has central heating. It's got cent It's got top of the line. It's got its own generator. It's got uh, it's got the two heating systems in there. It's got a propane heater which does the large area. It's got a heat exchanger that does the back area. So even if the power went out, the generator would kick on. I mean, it was this is top this is top notch. And the maintenance people, they, they have they a, use that now, right? So. No, they have their office. There, there is an office that has the whole command center set up in it as well in the center of the high school. That's where their main wow. place is. So this was built in addition to. This seems like a no-brainer. I was just, my, my biggest concern with the Raven, don't lose your thought. Uh, my biggest concern with the Raven at the time, again, was just that, you know, that the reason that that was such a good project was it didn't sound like it was going to be that much and it would get that building off the property and put something in its place because again the building's got got issues so. go on i have a couple well, questions I, too I, I, I apologize i don't know where where is the warehouse about so next to the right to the s oh, right next to the yeah, so that, isn't that the maintenance building, Shed building. it's just it's, it's a warehouse their their actual offices and stuff are in the high school there is another full blown office that was built in there that probably shouldn't have been um, so there are what, what i call two command centers so there's a full command center in the high school, in the center of the high school, and the, the custodial office is in there, which is the, you know, the nine screens on the wall to monitor everything. If there's a, a lockdown, it's where the police would go and, and command things from. But the second one was built in the back of that warehouse. Right. And right. wasn't that because, is that, is, that was because so they could have a remote one if they needed, right? Or My does it matter? I mean, you've been, you've been updating and working on safety protocols. Do that, need that? I, I can give you what I know. Um, <laughs> one is I do not believe in talking with Robin that they were aware that that was going in there, in the warehouse, the second command center. Um, the second thing that I can tell you is I know when Brett brought me around on the first day and was introducing me to the then facilities manager, I can remember Brent asking that person, okay, so um, now that you've got the command center set up at the high school, when are you, when are you moving you know, the couple of folks here out? So I don't think Brent may have been aware. Um, that was my impression on the, the discussion that happened. Um, so um, yeah, it was, it, was a, it was just interesting. So again, you got a beautiful, there was a beautiful space there. These kids deserve it. I mean, that building has fallen to, excuse the expression, crap around their ears over the last, last decade. So, so does what the Raven the, building not well, still need to be removed? So the yeah, problem with the Ra so Raven building is um, it's 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 plentiful and it, it's just it's not appropriate to keep kids in there. Um, it's got mold issues. It's got leaks in the ceiling that were never repaired. So structurally, it's weak. The spacing. Uh, between whatever the supports are and a ceiling are too far apart for the amount of snow weights that we so get. So can we still get rid of it? Time. I mean, sounds like we well, just still need well, to get rid of it. Well, we could we could still we could still get rid of it. Um, but I was thinking, um, you know, if, if worst case scenario, if we had to store some of that stuff, that would be the place to do it. Couldn't um, you build a cheaper warehouse? Yeah, than yeah a, you than can just a build a shell. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can just build a shell. So it may it may be cheaper just to build a, another shell some somewhere or even on that location. Um, the reason the expenses were getting up to be so high um, is, like I said, there were other issues. Like the septic is a big one. They, they would have to get rid of the septic, run it out to the main sewage on the, on the town side. Um, you don't need a bathroom in the, you don't necessarily need a septic. Uh, With a shell, right? Like if you're the shell, no, right. you wouldn't even need water yeah. um, for the most part. You know, it's just, just a place to put stuff. Um, and then it was if all needed. the classroom pieces. Over to because they, they sometimes do little field trips over to the tech center. Or yep, they're still they're, they're pretty close. I mean, yeah, it's just so a little further good. walk, exercise, exercise, another, another tenth of a mile, maybe. You know, to have to, 
But the big thing is they're still, in, in talking with Jim at the beginning of this, they're still on the, the high school property because they do, they, they use the school nurse, they use the lunch, they, you know, if there's a, if there's a, a problem there, there's uh, administration close by that can help out. Um, so that was one of the reasons when we were looking at alternative sites that, you know, Jim was, really wasn't for. He's like, no, we get, we get those extra supports, we need to keep them. And this is... Well, this is a great idea. Yeah. A terrific idea. I mean, the only thing I would say, if you, if you were to do that, I would... I have not discussed it with anybody. This is the first time, yeah. with the exception of Robin earlier today. My only concern would be uh, they would have to get to the high school, right, mm -hmm. from there. And so I would say it would be more than just renovating mm -hmm. the building, putting in a sidewalk of some nature, because really the only way to get from there to the high school is on that road. There is a that. sidewalk, well, though. There's a, there's there's a, a sidewalk, sidewalk alongside the parking right. lot. Alongside the parking lot, but it ends, doesn't it? It ends. It, oh, it does. does. It, like, it, it does. It ends yeah. at the, at the end yeah. of the parking lot. Okay. So, oh, yeah, because yeah. yeah. it's expecting people to one way around yeah. the building, because yeah. I assume you don't want them walking through that class. Well, the, right the other mm -hmm. piece that we kind of touched on that would go along with that idea is um, the fact that they do have to repay that. I mean, that's, that's, right. that's, that's one of the other pieces. And, and so that's one of the other reasons I'm kind of getting hesitant when I see that 1.3 million, like you guys are, is look, we've got to put a roof on Randolph Elementary within the, sometime in the next right. five years. It'd be, it's more cost effective to do it all at once than to do a piecemeal. Um, we've got the, and we've got the, the, the repaving to do, and we've got to rebuild parts of the back of the high school, especially the loading docks that's crumbling. It's just not safe. I mean, so we've got, got some major things and if we're, we're pumping all this money in there we don't need to Maybe yeah it's a good idea get the, um, environmental resource management class to do sort of a multi-use path it's that true. sort of brings them around the back of the building right there is no path going around the back it's true. Right, yeah. there is there is a i mean we walk walk I mean, that, that way to get to the sports fields we all do yeah you know to get out to the sports field but that way or maybe that could be something maybe jim would do that with the, the students, you know, it could be yeah. part of what they do is make a multi-use path. Yeah. But, but then it, you have to maintain it in the wintertime to keep it mm -hmm. True. nice covered, but it might be, it might be nice to then have a, a nicer walkway from that back parking lot yeah. around. And with the whole, you know, the locking of the back door now, we do need to think about and I've always been a little nervous with the kids from the elementary school who come to that crosswalk, and then they're in the parking lot. You know, there's yeah. no real, really good pedestrian way for them to maneuver through that parking lot. And you've got these little, you know, third graders. Can't see, can't be seen over the hood. You can't really see yeah. them, you know, and they're walking, they're navigating through the parking lot, which is one of the most dangerous places for a bunch of teenagers. But well, we have a uh, part, so part of the. I mean, that would kill two birds. Yeah, and part of the priority piece, too, was if they do the repaving as well, was to change the traffic pattern in front of the, the high school. You know, we do have that right away between the two houses. Um, that does need to be fixed because what happened is they kept it dirt. Over the course of time, they keep adding more dirt to it. So now when it rains, all the water pours into the basement of the two houses. But wait a minute. Those, that that A-frame? Yeah, the A-frame. Did the guy finally, because before... It was paved. It, oh yeah, now, well, now the problem is, is because, because they put the dirt in there and it built it up, it's, uh, the water all pours into the basement. So they're quite happy to have it paved. <laughs> it, oh, it used yeah. to be paved. That, that's my understanding. Well, in writing. Yeah. yeah. Well, if we, if we have right away on it, it may be in writing for me. Irrelevant, before. yeah. But we'll, we'll check. Did but, the owner change? I don't think so. so. That we have a don't know. Then that no, was my his, his house burned down and he moved into the A-frame is from yeah. what I... And I'm it's repeating, a while I'm, now, I'm repeating what, I've, what I've heard from the, the folks at the tech center and from the facilities folks when I say that. I haven't talked with the gentleman directly. So. Yeah, well, I'd be careful what you do, and I would make sure we know who has right away to what. Because yep, right. we thought we did, and we paved it. I think, is that we, what happened? And we yeah. took the and pavement up. And then he <laughs> bust at us, and That's so right. we were like, okay, All right. fine. So we don't want to go through that. Yeah, no, let me make that, let me. <laughs> That's a pain we don't want to go through. Right. Let's not do that again. All right, let's move on, if we can. I think that's really interesting, the whole idea about Raven. It's, it's great. All right. Laura, the other thing is the warning. Don't forget, you got to either prove it or at least look at it. I thought we did. Okay, did we? You did the budget. But oh, you okay. Uh, we haven't hit the consent agenda yet, have we? 
No, that was, I guess that was in board management and governance. Oops, sorry about that. Okay. So everyone has a, or should have a copy of the warning. It may be on the table there in front of Paul. Yeah, it's in here. Everybody got one? Um, yep. We will all have to sign the official copy, which I have here. Um, that will be published. So this is just the warning for the annual school district meeting held on Monday, March 4th. Um, it's always at the high school. Oh, so that's part of the warning. So you want, to, you want me to discuss? With I sure. Yeah. So this is um, this is what goes out to the the community to warn them ahead of time of the things that they would you know be, be voting on. Um, so you know some of it is your uh, the, the three of you that are up for for re-election. Um, it's electing the um, the officers uh, for the district, like the treasurer. It's also um, putting out the uh, the vote for the budget. So if you go down to Article 10 and take a look at that, remember I said don't get get scared when you see that 19.4. It's actually 18.5. It just looks that much more because we got to put the the the, um, the federal grant monies in there. Um, if you flip the page, we get to uh, surplus funding. Um, all right, so this year um, we had uh, $529,326 in surplus. Um, one of the things that I want to say on the surplus, because this was another misconception that was brought up at the, the Wednesday meeting, is where it comes from. Um, it has nothing to do with mismanagement of the budget. You've always had a surplus for a number of years, and there's a very good reason why. When we plan a budget, we do it a year in advance. Um, the biggest portion of the surplus comes from staff turnover. You have people that retire high, and you hire in people that are lower on the pay scale. Because your staff turnover has generally been around 14 people per year, the what you get for surplus is generally about the same, right? It's usually in that four to $500,000 range. The other place where it comes from is there are reimbursements that we get. Um, in some cases, we have to budget ahead of time at the beginning of the year for things that we know we're gonna get reimbursed for at the end of the year from the state. But we have to have the money available up front to be able to pay the bills when it's due. Pay the bills and then we get reimbursed. And some of those can be predicted, so they're, they're, they're zeroed out. Some of them cannot. You get kids that move in in the middle of the year that you gotta, yeah. So there's, there, there's, that's the other piece of it. So just, just so folks are aware where the surpluses are coming from. So with that 529,000, um, we're looking to do two things, and then we'll talk about the very last one, uh, the, the 130,000. Um, 400,000 to go into facility in, in the maintenance reserve fund. And the reason for that is we've got uh, a, a pretty high need. Um, right now there was a lot of maintenance, especially in terms of HVAC, that just was not done. A lot of things that needed to be replaced on schedule that were not replaced on schedule. So we want to make sure that that, that fund is, is where it needs to be in case we have to tap it. We've got the roof that's coming up. We're talking about the paving. Um, we're talking about you know the Raven piece, whatever the, the, the final determination is going to be on that. Um, so to keep that... Uh, that uh, surplus fund kind of bulked up there. Um, in terms of the other portion of this, we're looking to transfer $129,376 into the transportation reserve fund. Traditionally, we buy a bus or two a year um, to kind of make sure that the fleet doesn't get to be more than you know seven or eight years old. That allows us to do that. Um, there is enough money in that $129,000 to buy a bus. Um, as well as we have another 100000 in the regular budget to buy the second bus, um, should we need to. The 29376 that's in there um, would potentially cover the cost to buy an additional vehicle. Um, we have one of the co-facilities directors that is driving his own vehicle back and forth at $0.58 cents a mile. Um, we can get a, you know, a $50,000 truck through the state contract for about $30,000, um, throw a snow plow on it and everything else and use it um, for those supports and so that we're not paying those, those additional fees for the mileage, get them out of his own, own personal car. So those are the ideas there. Article uh, 8, um, what this is, is we talked um, earlier about the fact that um, special education is switching to a block grant in another year or two. And that means that you get the money up front, 
you don't necessarily get reimbursed unless there's some extremely high spending that goes on. So if you have kids that move in that have uh, moderate needs that you may have to send out at $64,000 a pop in around that range, we're not getting reimbursed for it and it'll blow our budget out of the water really quick. So how can the state do that? Because they were under the assumption that we touched on it a little bit earlier, that revamping special education, um, that it was all about kids with academic disabilities. You can do that with academic disabilities if you provide additional supports um, within your schools and you make sure the teachers are providing the best first instruction right out of the, right out of the gate. But the problem is the kids that we're encountering uh, more and more are the trauma-based students. This would not help with that. So, you know, we had, had a kid move in last year. Actually, we had the two moved in last year. That was, there were 300 some odd thousand out of the blue. If we've already got our block grants in place, we got that money at the beginning of the year, those kids move in, we're gonna get reimbursed for a little bit of it at the end of the year, but we just blew our budget out of the water by 300,000. So the suggestion is, is to make, and we checked with um, the, 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 the big wigs at, at AOE, um, to make a surplus fund for special education. Yeah, we get the block grant, but at least we have a little money set aside in the surplus fund if we get a real expensive kid that moves in in the middle of the year that we're not gonna get reimbursed for. If we have to, we can tap the fund to supply that. This so hundred- What does the state expect a district to do? Go into deficit spending if in the middle of the year you get somebody- Their, their logic was, was and, and again, they did it backwards, their logic was if you fix the deficiencies in your district, everything will be fine. But what they are doing, how they're making you try to do that is they're trying to make you do that by changing the budget first to force you to do it, as opposed to fixing the deficiencies first and then changing the budget to align So do with they it. think that school districts are sending kids out more than they need to, or? Um, they also did a pilot project of which we were one district where they sent people to evaluate the way we deliver special education. Yeah, the DMG. And so there was quite a discussion and, and, you know, sort of change in the way schools are delivering special education to make it more efficient and less costly. And, and so there, we were part of that pilot and project. And they are, they are correct. There are ways to make it more efficient and less con costly, but it focuses on academics it does not focus on, not the on behavior. yeah and so that's going to be that's going to be the problem so this hundred and thirty thousand this is not part of the surplus from this year um, there was money that was set aside a few years back um, because the state was requiring the school districts to change over its financial software package mm -hmm. so there was money that was set aside in a little surplus fund to be tapped for that purpose the state has purchased its own software package and is supposedly giving it to all the districts for free as long as we use it. Um, so that money is no longer needed. So what I'm suggesting is that that 130,000 be moved out of that uh, financial software surplus fund, which is no longer needed, and put into the special education fund. Once we put money into, say we put it into this surplus, special ed surplus, mm -hmm. say you get to the end of the year and Sits there for the next yeah. year. But what if you had another expense that came up? Is it, are we earmarking it to that and then you can't So it one, once you have voted to put it into a surplus account, it takes a town vote to move it to another account. Because so that's why it's, it's on the warning, and that's a very right. good question. Right. You're, you're getting the taxpayers to agree, instead of giving this money back to the state, um, which should go back to the taxpayers, it wouldn't. Um, instead of giving this money back to the state, we are voting to keep this money, uh, but you have to use it for the purposes that you've specified for. If you're gonna change that, they have to vote to allow you to change that. I apologize for pointing, I'm tired and jiggling around a little bit. So I don't know if there's questions on any of the, the warrant pieces. Most this that everyone needs to sign um, for publication. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's move on. Um, EL monitoring reports. We have two reports. We reviewed them, discussed them last month. Um, people were invited to go and do further research if they had questions um, for Lane or needed further background about these reports, so they are still, um, or again, included in our packet 
2.4 and 2.5. Did anyone have any further questions or, for Lane on the reports? Since we discussed them um, last time, unless you, anyone has any further questions, I think we should be able to vote on whether to approve them or not. So can I have a motion to approve EL 2.4? I'll make the motion to approve 2.4. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor of approving um, the monitoring report 2.4? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. And same for 2.5, which we also discussed uh, last meeting. And um, anyone who wanted further information or, or have questions answered was able to go to the OSSD. Why is 3.4 in parentheses? On which piece? It says 2.5 and then in parentheses 3.4. That's probably the, your requirements under your policies that you review That's with? ENDS monitoring, yep. Okay. Yeah. Um, so do I have a motion to approve 2.5 as written? I'll make the motion to approve 2.5 as written. Second? I'll second it. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, um, for ENDS monitoring, board observation of school events is something that we uh, decided quite some time ago not to do anymore. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, I did reach out, or I am reaching out to Val Gardner to help us figure out what type of ENDS monitoring activity should have replaced that. So um, we will, be having a retreat sometime um, in probably late March to do our PG training, and um, I would like it to focus on ENDS monitoring. So let's move on to consent agenda. Approve minutes from the OSSD meeting in December. Um, did anyone have any additions or corrections to that, to those minutes? Do I have a, well, let's just approve the consent agenda as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, we need to set the high school choice capacity limits. Um, that, Lane, you want to speak to that? I think that form is in there. Um, this is for uh, school choice at the high school level. Um, you know, obviously we want to take in as many kids as we can, but we don't want to overdo it. We don't want to get it to the point where in the middle of the year we got to add staff. So I, I think I put in 100 um, to add. And then um, I looked at the formulas that they had in terms of, uh, requirements for allowing um, students to go to other schools, so I, I put in what the minimum was from the form. Was it 25? 20. 20. Yeah. What typically, what, I mean, usually we only send four or five out, right? And yeah. how many did we take this year? School choice. Mm -hmm. um, brand new this year or total? Total. I think we had about probably 15, 16 new. Um, and add that to another, you know, 15, 16 that we had there. Okay. Um, so quite a bit below yeah. the 100. Yeah. All right. Um, and we do have, we did check, we do have the capacity for that at the, the high school without blowing things and out. And how many do we have to leave? How many do we have to go? It's not many, four or five probably, yeah. Um, if, actually, if you want, I'll get you exact numbers. Um, what do we need just to approve those limits? Yep. Okay. That will be part of the consent agenda then. Approval of AOE financial management questionnaire. I, I think that's in, is that what this is, yeah. Linda? Yeah. yeah. So, so basically it's indicating that, you know, we're doing certain things the state wants us to do. It indicates to the state um, who to contact, um, that sort of thing. Um, this is something new to me. I don't Robin remember it. completed that. Yep. yep. Pardon? Robin completed that. Okay. And so all they, all they need now is a signature from us? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, approved announced tuitions. That's in there. They're actually down a little bit um, from last year, which is, which is good. Um, and that's because the, the numbers are up. Oh, so yeah. when the numbers go up, the, the tuitions that Even were. Even though our people Yeah. Yep. Approve Raven Collaborative Agreement for 2019 and 20. And that's just uh, the, the agreement that exists with the sending towns to have their students um, attend Raven. Uh, so no change there. 
And approval of professional staff contract for a long-term sub, I see that that's in here too. That's just a person that is going to be longer than the general. Yeah, they had, um, the, if I, there were two of them, if I remember. There was one that is taking over for a person going out like on maternity, and then as soon as that one's done, there's another maternity mm. that's, that's coming up. So it just made sense to keep them on. Okay. Yeah, get them climatized to the kids in the school. And... Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda as a slate? A second? I'll second. All those in favor of approving the consent agenda? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Um, we have the superintendent's report enclosed for the agenda. Lane, is there something you want to add or? Uh, the superintendent's report is basically the annual report. Um, this time, same thing that you probably saw from the principals. Um, and it really just focuses on the communication strategy. Um, to the community about you know the, the the rationale behind the budget and why it's important that it pass. Um, it's being called um, to write three different articles. The first of which went out um, last week. That was what was up on the front page for. Uh, from, yeah, I keep getting that wrong for some reason. Um, but there'll be two two more write ups and then a final one um, that's in addition to that'll go out. So it's basically the communication strategies there. <clears throat> and Ben was uh, Ben was great. Ben and I worked together on that. There's also the uh, principal's reports, which will also be published in the town supplement um, before our vote. Um, same with the annual report from um, RTCC and from the high school. So all of those things are included in our packets. And all will go out to the town. The financial report. Do you want to speak to that? Is there, are there any yeah, there, changes um, or Typically what, what I do when I look at this, if you look at one of the expenditures pages and you go down to the bottom of one of the sections on the right where it says percent, um, just as a rough rule of thumb to, to kind of focus things, we're halfway through the year, right? We're at the end of December at six months. So you would expect them to be around 50%. So it's, and they're not all linear. You know, sometimes there's stuff that has to be paid up front. Sometimes there's stuff that's paid up at the end. But on, on average, if I see something that's way out of way out of line with that, that's usually when I start asking um, questions. So things are actually pretty good. The the, the couple of things that I things that I do want to point out is we have made uh, twenty five thousand on our uh, our uh, daycare revenue at uh, Braintree. So those are that's the portion of the day that the parents are actually paying for, and I believe there's another four thousand or so that is is being has been made so far by the um, the after school program that's there. Uh, da, 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 the eighty seven thousand in the hole in terms of um, the school lunches uh, is actually because the um, we don't have the December money in yet, um, but we're actually ahead of where we typically are by quite a bit this time of year. So hopefully that, that looks like that's on a, a, a pretty good um, pretty good turnaround. But those are the big things that kind of jumped out um, when I took a look at it. Unless there's other questions. Are there any other questions from the board? Hearing none, um, we can talk about the next is board evaluation. That was you, Paul. Um, I'm not going to read down the sheet. However, uh, I would say that we listened to each other. Um, we um, had diversity of viewpoints. Multiple were, were speaking, not wasn't monopolized uh, by any one person, and everybody appeared to be prepared for the meeting. And um, I would say we need to work on not getting bogged down on some details and not getting behind um, the schedule we were tending to. Uh, I think we, we really underestimated the time necessary, yeah. you know, so that was our but fault. It's 8.30, so it's still right within our normal board times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I would say uh, overall we did well. Um, are we going to have, do we need an executive session? Okay. Yeah. I have, a, I should, the two, two little updates that just, just came in incidental wise. 
Um, they did, um, they've been doing a lot of work on the water system here. Um, they did have a coliform test come back. Um, so they've chlorinated the water. They're going to test for a while, but we still have the, everybody's mm. aware, we still have those. So that I think it's, I think it's 90 days of testing they have to do, but I'll, I'll reconfirm. I just got that, that information um, a little while ago. Speaking uh, of water, I know we're not supposed to be going over time, but yep. there, there was a bunch of stuff in the news about all of these schools in Vermont that where the water had led. We did. Um, we did do the testing. They they did some sample schools, and so now what it sounds like is uh, we're waiting for the last round of testing to come back after we change our faucets. Um, yeah. So we, we narrowed it. It came back positive on one tap. Um, they narrowed it down to, to thinking that because the taps are old, sometimes they use lead in the, the part that seals. So we've gone through, we replaced the taps, and we're waiting for the, the, the round of testing after the replacement to come back. So that's pending. And, and now the other schools passed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was uh, the, the testing the state that also dealt with some um, cleaning agents to see if it was getting into the well water, typically use cleaning right, agents. PDA thing. Yeah, for chlorate or, yeah. Right. I, I'm a, I had a lot of chemistry too, and I don't remember which which it was, but we came back perfect on that. Okay. Um, but you know, we are still there's ongoing issues here that we're still working on. What about the radon issue too? That seems to be is that is the state offering is, radon tests? No, the um, there was a initiative that just came out by the Secretary of Ed uh, to test every tap in every school in the state, uh, and so that actually it looks like it's passed and it's going to happen. Um, so, you know, we had to do some survey data to tell them how many, you know, different outlets we have that would have to be, be tested. Um, so that, that'll that happen. So you'll know every, they used to come in and just do some samples. You'll know every, yeah, well, every single one. Every single one. Yeah. Wow. I'd like to know where they're getting the money, but hey. I like it. <laughs> Anything else? Uh, you said you had two questions. Did you say you had two? No. Okay. All right, so we can adjourn.